Well, thanks for being here tonight. I wasn't too worked up or anxious or nervous to come talk to folks because fortunately or unfortunately, this is how I spend a lot of my time these days. I don't want to make any joke of it, but it, there is nothing natural about sitting on stage uh, with lights and cameras and microphones. and It's a, it's a very vulnerable experience for the last seven years, going around the world and telling people the most traumatic stories of my life, trying to contextualize those experiences, while also remaining very true to my original intention, uh, which was to talk about war in a serious fashion and not to get wrapped up in maybe the statistics or the empirical data as I find myself doing these days, but to really dig deep into the humanity of what it means to be a human being living on a planet with going on nine billion people by the middle of the century. So I want to tell you my personal story, a little bit of that, and my background. And then I would like to put this into a bigger context of a collapsing society in the United States, of a military empire that's run amok, that controls almost every facet and every institution in American culture, political culture, economic society, and so forth. And also, as I just got done speaking with Peter Boyle from Green Left about the ecological devastation, patriarchy, the prison industrial complex, sexism and racism, homophobia, and all of the lunacy that's inherent to this culture. So I grew up on the southeast side of Chicago in a working class family. My dad was a union iron worker. My mother was a stay at home mom, took care of my brother and I. And when people ask me why I joined the Marine Corps, it's not really a simple answer. But I do like to remind folks that in the United States, there's nothing out of the ordinary about joining the armed forces. It's promoted, glorified, all the mythologies about fighting war, what it means to be a big, tough guy, big, tough male in this society. You know, being a badass, you go pick up a gun and you go kill people. You know, you treat women like shit. Uh, you treat other races and other ethnicities like shit. This is part of American ideology and American culture growing up. I grew up playing army with my brother. You know, I was shooting guns, shotguns, pistols, and AK-47s by the time I was 12 years old. Everybody in America has guns. It's part of the culture. It's part of what people do. They play the video games nonstop. James Bond wore this, Navy SEALs this, and watched all the movies. You know, all the same Hollywood movies that a lot of middle American kids watch and glorify. Going to war, special forces, jumping out of airplanes, shooting weapons, blowing stuff up, womanizing, taking drugs, that's all glorified. It's all part of the cultural ideology. That's what American society is all about. So it was no surprise or big thing for me to join the Marine Corps. Once I did join, for me it became glaringly apparent that I did not want to be a part of the institution. People often ask, when did this big shift change? You know, when did you make this decision that you were against the war? When did you become politically conscious? You know, for me, it wasn't reading a book. It wasn't going to a lecture. It wasn't a pamphlet that somebody handed out to me. And that's not to say that any of those events or activities aren't worthwhile, I'm just being honest. You know, for me, it was conversations with my friends. It was cultural activities. While I was in the Marine Corps, my friends were going to the University of Indiana, Purdue University, and Northwestern University, and they were handing me books by Jack Kerouac, and Hunter S. Thompson, and William S. Burroughs, and Allen Ginsberg, all the beatnik writers. And that's who I started reading. That's who got me 
clued in. I started to hang out with my friends and smoke pot, take mushrooms, eat LSD. Uh, the, it, it opened my mind. Um, it's hard to talk about that in a serious way with folks sometimes in activist circles because it's like some passe 60s thing. It's like, oh yeah, it's hippie nonsense, you know, whatever. No, there's something very real to that. It snapped me out of that thinking, of being a machine and feeling disempowered and feeling as though I had no agency inside of this gigantic institution of the military industrial complex. It took something different to snap me out of that. And it was cultural activities. And then I went on my second deployment. And why did I go? Well, I didn't want to leave my buddies behind. It's very simple. You train with them, you sleep next to them, you party with them, you dig holes with them, go on hikes with them. Uh, you're, they're your best friends. And so I wasn't going to leave them while they went on a second deployment. And so I went. And during that second deployment, you know, what did we do? Um, well, my fellow Marines were taking it upon themselves to shoot at Iraqis, uh, beat up the women, smack prisoners around, torture them, play with dead corpses, take pictures with them. Um, the kinds of things that we see in the media that are talked about as aberrations or a few bad apples was my regular experience in Iraq. And what prepared us for that? Well, the training, and it's inherent to 13 weeks of boot camp and eight weeks of training you how to be a well-oiled killer in the School of Infantry. And we must not forget that that's exactly what the military institution is there for, is to kill and destroy. And so what happened during that training? Well, we referred to people as sand niggers, as hajis, camel jockeys, towel heads. That's how we referred to people of Iraq and Afghanistan. That's how our command referred to them. That's how our drill instructors referred to them. That's how the officers referred to them. It's the only way you can get 17, 18, 19 year old kids to fly 7,000 miles from home and kill people, is if those people aren't considered people. Much like in Vietnam, when people were considered rice paddies and zipper heads and gooks. The dehumanization process, the racism, the xenophobia is inherent, again, not only to the military training, but to Western culture and also American society. And so when we were overseas and we would run into Iraqis in the street and in their homes, and they would tell us, leave, you know, bad bush is what they would continually chant, or you killed my family, or why is my building destroyed, or why don't I have a school to go to, or why is my hospital destroyed, or why don't we have an economy? Or why did you dismantle the police forces? Why are you propping up these corrupt leaders? Anyone, I think, with half of a brain and some sense of morality and consciousness could see on the ground that it was a disaster. You know, one of the stories I tell is the first time and this will give you an idea of how laissez-faire things take place in Iraq. But the first time, or the laissez-faire attitude in which people process these situations. But I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was taking an English 101 class, and they asked us to write the most traumatic experience of your life. So a lot of kids were writing about like how they got dumped at prom, and you know how they got kicked off the football team, and different things and, and it, it just sort of spewed out of me and I had to talk about the first time I had killed someone. And it was an up close and personal experience and you know when that happened and afterwards what they did, uh, the command and those who we were serving with, they just picked up the body um, and they threw it out of this drainage ditch. They just threw it on the side of the road. And they cracked a couple of glow sticks and threw it next to the body and hoped that, you know, maybe a helicopter or an ambulance will pick them up in a couple weeks. And when we got back to the base, 
Um, one of my good friends had taken a picture of the guy's head, so I had shot him in the, uh, in the front of his head, I'm sorry, in the back of his head, and in the front of his head had like a softball-sized gaping wound. You know, his brain had fallen out of his head, and it was a mess. And uh, one of our Marines actually jumped on the body and started punching it in the face. And so angry, they didn't know what to do. And then when we got back on base after one of my fellow Marines took a picture of this, uh, he put it up as a laptop screensaver uh, on his laptop. So he wanted to remind everybody. It's like, this is what we're here for. We're here to kill as many Iraqis as possible. That's what people were motivated to do. That's what we were trained to do. This notion of democracy building and bringing humanity, you know, the white man's burden, it's a familiar story. Anyone who reads history is familiar with that story. And it's old. It's been going on for a long time. And so when I came home, I had made the decision, well, I should back up, actually. They wanted to deploy me for a third time. At that point, I had refused. And I told them I would no longer pick up a weapon. I wouldn't go to the armory. And if they tried to get me to go on a plane, I simply wouldn't go. So my options at that point were either go to the brig, which I was willing to do, lay down my weapon and check myself into a mental health facility, which I was willing to do and did do, um, you know, kill someone in my command, which I was more than capable of doing and willing to do at that point, or kill myself, which 22 veterans a day do in the United States. it has been over 7,000 veterans who've committed suicide since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had begun. Uh, obviously, a lot of them feel the same way, and they don't know how to process it. A lot of people ask me, why, why don't more soldiers, why don't more Marines stand up and speak out? You know, a lot of folks are simply trying to put their lives back together, for one. And for two, you don't want to go to a place to go kill people and have some of your best friends killed or pick up their body parts or go home and explain to their parents why they don't have a face anymore, why they're gone. The last thing you want to do is come home and come to the realization that that was for the benefit of multinational corporations, global capitalism, banks, geopolitical interests. It's a tough pill to swallow. It is reality, but it is a tough pill to swallow. Hence the reason these veterans blow their heads off. Hence the reason one-fourth of the homeless population in the United States is made up of veterans. 150,000 to 250,000 veterans sleep homeless every night in America, the richest country in the world. And you know, all of this, the disproportionate statistics that we could see in society at large, we see within the military. So out of those 250,000 homeless veterans, you know, black and brown veterans only make up 26% of the armed forces in the United States. That's African American and Latin American veterans, 26% of the armed forces. Yet they make up 57% of the homeless population amongst veterans. The unemployment rate for veterans in the United States is twice that of the national average. And for African American and Latin American veterans, that number doubles to about 30%. Well, that's one out of three African American and Latin American veterans who are unemployed when they come home. But you know, if I was being honest with everybody in this room, the real reason I became opposed to the wars and the real reason why I continue to speak out if I was getting down to the core of it is for the people of Iraq and of Afghanistan and now as of course, when you first start, it's one thing, you know, it's Iraq. You know, then you learn about American foreign policy, and we can get into that. But I'll speak specifically for the people of Iraq in my personal experience for a little while. That's why I became involved. I became involved not because of what it was doing to American servicemen and women, not because of what it was doing to the American economy, not because of what it was doing to America as a, on a whole. I became involved because of the 250,000 to a million Iraqis that are estimated to be dead right now. Because of the four to seven million Iraqis who are displaced either internally or externally in a nation of 25 to 30 million people. I became involved because 
in American society, and I'm assuming it's the same here, you, they don't put people from Iraq and Afghanistan on TV. It's some white analyst from some college-educated institution or some state apparatus institution, you know, regurgitating talking points. They don't actually talk to the people in Iraq and Afghanistan, and those people are not given a space in this society, and many times not even within anti-war circles, where I often see a lot of white people pontificating about what should happen in the Middle East, yet, oh, so rare is it to hear from someone from those countries articulating what it is they want in their own countries and for their people. And that's why I continue to do this work. It's for many other reasons now. You know, as I mentioned, it started out small. It was Iraq. I was upset about U.S. foreign policy. I was upset about what was happening. You know, then I started to read about Palestine. Then I started to read about a history of U.S. involvement in the Middle East. Then I would read about the British involvement in the Middle East and other Western powers. I started to think about this and contextualize this. I started to think about American empire. The fact that we spend what the rest of the world spends combined on our military. A trillion dollars a year the United States spends on the military industrial complex. With a thousand military bases around the world and now using Australia as an offshoot country, expecting Australia to be sort of a lapdog for US interests. And it has been. Obviously, the people of Australia and the Australian government has capitulated to whatever the United States wants. When we say jump, this country jumps. And it's not just here. You read about the history of the United States which is very parallel to the history of Australia. A land without a people, right? A land with barbarians and savages and primitive beings running around, you know. It's the same history in the United States. It's built on genocide. The culture is built on brutality. It's built on occupation. It's built on violence. This is nothing new and it shouldn't be surprising. For Native Americans in the United States, it's nothing new as they live at the same standard of living as those living in Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It's within the United States, where the per capita income on Pine Ridge, South Dakota is $2,500 a year. It's in South Dakota. It's nothing new for African Americans in the United States. 400 years of slavery, 400 years of being considered less than human. They know the history is quite clear. It's nothing new for people in Latin America. The devastation that's been ravaged throughout that continent, which was considered for 200 years to be America's backyard, you know, where we would get cheap goods and services, open up markets for bananas, fruits, vegetables, agricultural products, sugarcane. None of this is new, and none of this should surprise us. And so I started to think about those issues. Then when I became involved with Iraq Veterans Against the War, we would work in black communities in Chicago, you know, where I'm from. And those communities on the south side of Chicago, where the infant mortality rate is the same as Beirut, Lebanon. And this is, again, in the richest country in the world. Where one-fifth of the African-American children on the south side of Chicago can't meet the minimum requirement of a thousand calories a day. Started to work in these communities, started to think about race. Started to connect that with the dehumanization of the people of Iraq. Started to think about sexism and patriarchy and misogyny when I started to talk to my sisters coming home from their service, one-third of whom are reporting military sexual trauma. They've been raped or sexually assaulted by their fellow servicemen while in service. One third. Do you know what we referred to women Marines as? WMs? Walking mattresses. That's what we would refer to them on base. So again, it shouldn't be a surprise. It's a culture built on patriarchy. It's a culture built on the notion and the idea 
that women are here, much like the planet, much like the third world, for us to exploit and use at our will. And so I started to think about that and started to work with women who have been raped. And psychologists and psychiatrists will tell you that there's only, besides killing someone or besides going through a traumatic experience of seeing grotesque violence, the only thing that's worse is being sexually assaulted or raped. So the women in the military, not only are they dealing with those visions and with those experiences of grotesque violence, they're also dealing with being raped and sexually assaulted at the hands of their fellow servicemen. You know, then we started to work with prison groups. You know, I learned that the United States had the largest prison population in the, in the world. And of course, disproportionately represented by African Americans and Latin Americans. Started to see the connections between the prison industrial complex and the military industrial complex between the prison industrial complex and the war on drugs, between sexism and patriarchy and misogyny and militarism, U.S. empire, U.S. capitalism, global finance capitalism. How is it connected? What does it do? What does it require? Started to think much bigger than just the war. And then for the last few years, I've been thinking a lot about the environment. You know, the United States military and the connection to U.S. empire and militarism is that the U.S. military empire uses more fossil fuels than 99% of the nations on this planet. With 1,000 military bases and 14 aircraft carriers, thousands of helicopters, thousands of fighter jets, tanks, Humvees, armored vehicles, amphibious assault vehicles, cutters, boats, all of this requires an industrial infrastructure that's killing the planet the constant extraction of fossil fuels. I started to think about the lunacy in the context that we're living in. You know, I pick up the New York Times the day before my birthday last year, May 9th, and NASA's former top climate scientist, James Hansen, wrote an article about the Keystone XL pipeline in the United States and Canada that's being built right now. He estimates that if we were to fully exploit the Keystone XL pipeline and existing fossil fuel sources, that we will pump more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than had been in the atmosphere in 2.5 million years since the Pliocene era, when sea levels were 60 feet higher than they are right now. The Global Climate Vulnerable Forum, a collection of 25 developing nations from around the world, get, got together last year trying to estimate what the damage of climate change is going to look like. They estimate that just in developing countries, by the end of 2020, there will be 400 million deaths attributed to climate change. Now scientists are thinking, well, geez, we thought the polar ice caps weren't going to melt until 10 years from now, but this year it turns out they're melting. In the southwest in the United States, we're running out of fresh water. Cities like Las Vegas, Nevada, San Diego, California, Los Angeles, California, Phoenix, Arizona, they shouldn't exist. The only reason they do exist is because we rerouted one of the largest rivers in the world, the Colorado River, by building one of the largest dams in the world so we could provide electricity and air conditioning so people can live in 120 degree heat. Well now in Arizona and Las Vegas, it hasn't gotten under 91 degrees for seven days straight. It's the first time that's ever happened. You know, as my friend in somewhat of a mentor often mentions. Uh, this gentleman, some of you might be familiar with his work. I hope if you're not, you should check it out. Uh, but Derek Jensen often mentions, you know, 98% of old growth forests gone, 90% of prairies gone, 200 species becoming extinct daily. And by 2048, most oceanographers project that there will no longer be large fish in the ocean leading some of them to joke cynically that next generation's children will enjoy plankton and jellyfish burgers, if at all. We have an agricultural system in the United States that's devastating our soil and our natural environment. Industrial agriculture and Monsanto have turned our soil into a junkie that relies on petroleum-based fertilizers to grow food, and if it doesn't have it, we can't have food. This is what this culture has produced. 
It's much bigger than just the military. It's much bigger than just the war. It's much bigger than our individual concerns, although those are important as well. You know, I go to these events and sometimes I think people expect me to just talk about the war. And sometimes I guess I'll do that. But after seven years of doing this work, activist work, going around, talking with people, interviewing folks I do for my community radio program, speaking with victims of war, speaking with people who have been raped, speaking with people who have been in prison. It's hard to just talk about one issue as though it takes place in a vacuum, and I think it's disingenuous. And so the kind of work we've been trying to do with Iraq Veterans Against the War is to combat a lot of these things, and even things we see on the left. I mean, we see patriarchy and sexism and racism on the left. You know, for years we were like, my God, we never thought, for four or five years, how can our board of directors be overwhelmingly represented by white males? But it was. Why were our, organi our organizers, our field organizers, overly represented by white males? They were. How can we get our members to think about these issues and the interconnectedness of these issues so they can be true allies with other organizations and other people's movements and social movements and be a real ally to work with them? And what kind of resistance is it going to take to stop the wars? Because having the largest protests the world has ever seen obviously didn't do it. As a matter of fact, it didn't even make a dent. So another point that I think Derek would make and something that I would like to bring up is what kind of resistance movement are people in this room tonight willing to build? What are we willing to sacrifice? Is it going to take more marches, more petitions, more campaigns, more direct actions, more people getting arrested? Sure. I actually think it's going to take some people probably risking their lives. I actually think it's going to take some people probably taking very militant actions. I actually think it's going to take people who are willing to put their lives on the line and sacrifice part, a portion, or a good section of their lives in order to make this happen. You know, I'll speak from experience. In the United States, we only have 5% of the world's population, but we use 30% of the world's resources. We'd need several planet Earths if people wanted to live at the same standard of living as people in the United States. We'd need several planet Earths. With that amount and that tremendous amount of privilege from living within the empire, having three cars, boats, motorcycles, vacations, vacation homes, flying around the world, doing the whole cosmopolitan lifestyle that many in the Western world enjoy, I think we have a responsibility because our brothers and sisters in the developing nations, particularly the Middle East, have been in the streets. And people will make a million and a half excuses here. I've got a job. My favorite TV show's on. I've got a family reunion. I've got a rugby match to watch. I've got to go take my dog for a walk. I've got to go do this. I've got to go do that. In the meantime, we have all of the resources, all of the time in the world. Yes, your government is extremely corrupt. Yes, my government is extremely corrupt. However, we still have some semblance of a bastardized word and term, freedom, where I think we can actually build a resistance movement and have the ability to sit here tonight, whereas when I talk to my friends from Iraq, from the, from the oil union workers there, from the Federation of Oil Worker Union, and they can be killed, arrested, tortured, or beaten for holding the kind of meeting that we're holding here tonight, and yet they do it day in and day out for years at a time and continue to do it. So I don't want to hear anybody's excuses anymore. I'm tired of making excuses. And I don't know what I'm willing to sacrifice sometimes. People often ask me, oh, do you consider yourself a revolutionary? I don't. Why don't I? Because I don't think and I don't know if I'm willing to make the kind of sacrifices that I've read about with what I'm most familiar with, which is Latin American revolution. I've done a lot of reading and research and reflecting about revolutions in Latin America. And when I read about those actions, and when I read about the sacrifices those people took, and when I read about the level of devotion, commitment, seriousness, the analysis, and the discipline, to truly enact a revolutionary movement, I think to myself, yeah, we're light, light years behind. 
I don't want to sound defeatist. I want to pose this as a challenge. I think it should be a challenge. Of course, we need it all. I'm not a dogmatist. I'm not rigid. We need people who can answer phones. We need people who can sign petitions. We need people who know how to organize workshops. We need people who know how to develop campaigns. We know people who know how to run election campaigns. We, know, we need people who are artists. We need people who are graphic web designers. We need hackers. We need criminals. We need everyone. We need priests and nuns. But I also think that we're going to ask, have to ask ourselves what kind of a resistance movement, if everyone in this room is truly dedicated to peace and justice and to stopping these atrocities and stopping this culture from killing the world and killing us in its course, I think the real question becomes for all of us in this room is what are we willing to do? And what kind of resistance movement is it going to take to take down the most powerful institutions the world had ever seen? The US military industrial complex, global finance capitalism, weapons manufacturers. These people are not going to give up their power because we morally persuade them. This is where I agree with people like Stokely Carmichael, Malcolm X. I respect the work of people like Martin Luther King. I've worked with people who've marched next to Martin Luther King. I've actually had the chance to do work with Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, who was there when Martin Luther King had his throat blown off in Memphis and drug him into a hotel room while he bled all over his trousers and died. Now there's a lot of other things you could probably say about Reverend Jackson, but one thing you can't take away is the fact that he was there from the first day with King and the last day. And those stories from those people have led me to believe that because these institutions are even more entrenched and more powerful than they have ever been in the history of American society and in the world, that the people in this room who are concerned with these issues are going, us, we are going to have to ask ourselves and challenge each other. How committed are you to peace and justice? How committed are you to a world that's not being ravaged? How committed are you to ecological justice? How committed are you to feminism? Those are the things I ask myself every day. And sometimes I get beaten down, sometimes I get depressed, sometimes I get angry. But I'll agree with my brother Cornell West when he says that he is a prisoner of hope, but he's not too optimistic. I am a prisoner of hope. Why? Because I can fly halfway around the world and find 150 people who are interested in peace and justice. And there's many more people who are interested in peace and justice who aren't here tonight. And the challenge for us is not to create this insular world where we know all the answers and everybody else is just so fucked up and blah, blah, blah. Our challenge, if we want to build a serious resistance movement, is to find the elements in society who agree with these principles, to stop the sectarian bullshit, to stop the infighting, to stop attacking each other. The people in this room are not the enemy. I think everyone in this room has a very clear idea who the enemy is, but I know damn sure it's not anyone in this room, unless somebody from the FBI is out there. So I, I don't want us to continue the same bullshit I see in the United States amongst the left. People arguing, you know. People arguing over ideological purity. People arguing over whether or not their group's better than this group or this group screwed up 20 years ago. We still don't talk to them because they're Maoists and these guys are Trotskyists and these guys are Leninists and these guys read Slavoj Zizek but these guys actually like deconstructionism but these guys read Noam Chomsky but these guys are liberals but these guys are environmentalists. It's insane. I agree that we should have a vibrant intellectual debate about ideology and about philosophy, sure. But not if that's going to hinder us actually getting into a room with one another and talking about the fact that millions of people around the globe are being imprisoned, jailed, tortured, spied on, killed, and raped 
with, in our name and with our tax dollars. That's what I'm interested in doing. I hope other people in this room are interested in that as well. I simply want to thank you for sitting and opening your minds and your hearts for me to come here and talk to you this evening. It's a pleasure to be in a room with people who are interested in these issues and I hope interested in building a serious resistance movement to stop this culture from killing us. So thank you.